It's very official on that note. Hi, everybody. This is Shana Robinson, and this is Joe Maldonado, and we are on our Griffin's Claw School of Practical Magic coffee and tea segment. These segments are free. They, we offer them every month and they're half an hour long. And we just spend about half an hour with very magical people talking about their areas of expertise. So Shana has many areas of expertise. Um, but today we are specifically going to talk about ancestors. Um, and for those of you that don't know Shana, she is an author, she's a lecturer, um, and she has, I've asked her um, if she can post uh, her books that she's written here in the chat window. So there's not all of, mine, solo written. I've co-authored a couple of those. Yes. Yeah, so co-authors is good. <laughs> um, let me see. I've just got, I got a couple more people coming in. So let, you let them in. Um, but I think it's fascinating. You know, Shane and I were just talking about um, I just find it incredibly fascinating that um, people can actually write books. I, I cannot. Um, so, and everybody else that has just joined, if you can please um, mute much. your microphone and turn off your video. Um, so, Shana, fascinating topic, ancestors. Um, tell us, if you can, why did you get involved in, in this topic? Why does this particular topic resonate with you? As many of you may know, or Joe knows, um, my field that I come to a lot of this from is uh, shamanism. And as one works with shamanism, one understands that it is a practice built on relationships, relationships with helping spirits, relationships in a lot of different directions. So most people who come to shamanism initially, they look to a power animal for help. There's this idea that the animal world in spirit form can be a, of help. Then there's the teacher, the, the person, the being, the spirit in physical form, it just the appearance that perhaps they, they provide. And then there are other categories. We certainly know that the spirits of nature can come to us in many guises um, and be, be ally, allies, helpful. We also know that there's a significant other in the other world called the spirit mate that is helpful. But a very key relationship that we often overlook because it kind of gets pushed aside because we're busy learning about our power animals and our teachers and communing with nature is the field of the ancestor. And I came to this because I was perplexed. I was an adopted child and everybody's talking about ancestors, ancestors, ancestors. And I was feeling particularly excluded from the conversation because yes, I knew my dear parents. I knew their lines. I knew their great grands and all that, but who were mine? And so, you know, I think we're often given a mystery a puzzle, a conundrum. And it is through that puzzle or conundrum that we're drawn into areas of study and begin to make sense of the things that, that bother us or, or confuse us or, or cause us angst and trying to reconcile those things. So given shamanism, given my family background, those two components were, I, th I think, key to pulling me into this this view, <clears throat> this overview of and under, trying to understand mm -hmm. ancestors. Okay, mm -hmm. well, how can I play that game as well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How old were you when this thought occurred to you? Oh, ancient probably. Um, <laughs> <laughs> very, very old. Um, no, I, I think it, it's, it's a topic that's come around. And I think I find that too, in a lot of our spiritual studies, mm -hmm. we start out in a place. And then as we explore, we kind of move and we get a little bit understanding and we keep going and it drifts away, it drifts away, it drifts away. But then we're at a new point, we have a new understanding. And it becomes a kind of spiral of understanding as we move through different frequencies, mm -hmm. accommodating new information and understandings. So I can tell you that as a child, when I was very young, this idea of 
who are my real parents, where do I belong, all of that mm -hmm. was very prominent. But then yeah. you get involved in life and, you know, and everything is cool and it, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. And you get away from it until you sit in a classroom and somebody starts talking about kinship charts and you're going, mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. And then you do family trees and you're going to, hmm. And then it goes away again and stuff takes over and then it comes yeah. back around. So, you know, targeting when and how Mm -hmm. I think is, is, you know, I could probably draw a timeline and say here, here, and here. But I think one of my most clear moments came, um, and it's funny how lessons come to you. I was studying anthropology and Dr. Joe Fred Foster standing up in front of the room and I, umpty bump years ago says, people in our culture don't understand adoption. I was stunned, so stunned, I asked no further questions. Hmm. 30 years hence, Joe Fred Foster is still alive. Uh, Dr. Foster, I don't know if you remember me, but in <laughs> class one day, you said this. And I said, it's a long time coming, but what did you mean by this? <laughs> and we had a lovely discourse, um, which really, again, brought this idea of ancestors into a different kind of focus, understanding kinship in a different way. So, you know, you, you have these little moments where your mind blows up. And so my mind blew up and mm -hmm. here we are talking about ancestors. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that you had mentioned there are more than, it's, we always think of bloodlines. Okay? Right. And it never occurred to me to look at from the perspective of someone that is adopted. I, you know, had an obsessive mom that I collected photos back hundreds of years ago from all the relatives. So I have this big, we call it Bapcha's green suitcase, <laughs> you know, where you open it. And it's like, I don't know, hundreds of pictures of, some of them are labeled, some of them are not, but she always like said, here and she gave me the suitcase and said this is your family and i'm like oh okay but i you know i, I took that for granted you know because mm -hmm. people that are adopted or, or people that didn't have parents that were as obsessive as my mother was you know perhaps don't know that much or you mm -hmm. know or you know they question um, you know, like I'm beginning to have these kind of likes or dislikes towards something, or I'm really drawn to the Indian culture. Where does that come from? And you, and you start to explore, you know, you open up that door and you go, so, so you research it and you understand it. And maybe you go to someone, you know, who's a medium and, and says, oh, yeah, well, it's like a great aunt. Susu, you know, who was married to Uncle George, you know, you know, and had these children and they were from Iowa, you know, where they were from Ireland, you know, and then stuff starts to unfold and then you get direction as to how to explore more. So it can you I know you're going to talk about this in much more detail on in your class on April the 16th, but can you just tell us a little bit about the difference between bloodlines and what are the other lines that you had mentioned right when i do my morning prayers or or, or sit at my ancestors altar mm -hmm. um, my ancestor calls begin with to the bloodline to the milk line so ancestors of the blood ancestors of the milk ancestors of the heart ancestors of the spirit mm -hmm. ancestors of the tradition and ancestors of the territory Wow, there's a so, lot of ancestors. <laughs> and it, man, you're, if you're buying Christmas presents for all of these, forget it because you're yeah. going to go broke. <laughs> yeah. So the, the two main ones that seem to be of um, most significance to most people are understanding your bloodline. And should you have been adopted or fostered, you have a milk line. And I love this word. It comes from, uh, I think it's Ewan McEwen. The milk line is the line that nurtures you. It may not have been the line that into which you were born, from which your blood arose. Yeah. However, you were nurtured by a line. And in the Celtic tradition, what happens when you have a person who was adopted or fostered is you have a bloodline and a milk line that come together. Mm -hmm. And it's called the twinning. Mm -hmm. 
And so this twinning, this mm -hmm. idea of coming together means that you have a broader background for some reason. I mean, heaven only knows. Yeah. I mean, I could talk like my Jewish friends and, and say, Hashem tells you it'll, it'll be this way. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it, it's like you come together and for some reason in this body, in this time, this spirit required this information to be joined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it becomes almost an advantage, <laughs> you know, yeah. so what, what for me seemed to be a disability when I was growing up, I yeah. don't know my real family. I didn't right. really it's now like, wow, I have a lot of resource. Yeah. And I guess mm -hmm. one of the things that seems to be appropriate to, it's jumping into my mind here now about this idea of resource and pools of resource. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We all live in really, really mm -hmm. stressful times, right? Yes. We've got, we've got germs running around. We've got people running around with guns. We've got all sorts of crap going on on the planet. Yeah. And a lot of it is very frightening and as we come into this this um it's this kind of gestalt of, of fear and <laughs> angst and all of this is building up i think we can sometimes feel very lonely and like where do i find the courage how do i deal with this oh my god the world's going to end yeah well if we step back some of our resources and our resilience comes from connecting with our ancestors I think about my grandmother, mm -hmm. born in 1898. Mm -hmm. This is my father's, the, the, my adoptive father. I, he'll be, oh, okay. okay, language here. When I talk about mother and father, these are the people I lived with. Mm -hmm. When I talk about progenitor and progenitrix, those were the biological components from which I came. So that's oh, okay. the bloodline. Oh, okay. okay. So when I think about my father's mother, my Nana, she lived through well, her parents lived through the Civil War. Mm -hmm. She lived through World War One, World War Two. She saw the Korean conflict. She saw Vietnam. Uh, she lived through the Spanish flu. She's lived through all of that mm. before she died. So when you think about the depth of that life alone, yeah, and the fact that she lived through the Depression, she started out life as a, as a farm girl who rode a buckboard wagon to get to the train to get to um, school teachers college to learn to be a teacher mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then she saw computers and televisions and the first space launch so with that depth that she has as my milk line ancestress mm -hmm. nana can you just tell me how you make it through all this crap yeah, yeah. and i feel like when i spend time and just open myself to the deep understandings and wisdom that this person has i mean and this is only one of a multitude of of ancestors that go back with experiences they had courage they had resilience somehow they made it from birth to death i don't always know how well it went for them most of them it went just fine uh -huh. but there are keys to resilience in there and so that's part of dipping into that resource, that mm -hmm. um, that pool yeah. that we don't often think about. Because if we think about our power animals, yes, they may have been alive on the planet at one time. And now in spirit, they're here helping us. Yes. But their trials and tribulations were a bit different than ours. And mm -hmm. so they can't tell us what to do with a potato famine mm -hmm. they, or whatever. So mm -hmm. it's a different kind of pool of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Um, so you can, um, so those are your milk lines that you're- That's the milk line. Yeah. yeah because my they career. nurtured you when you were growing up. Absolutely. This is the family I know. These are, you know, you have Thanksgiving dinner. These are the people at the table. Yeah. Yeah. So who are your heart line peeps? Okay. So um, I'm just going to step back a little bit to let you know that through research i have found that i have a blood sister and a blood brother that i didn't know about so oh, i have wow. found i have found my the family of my progenitrix which is wow. interesting yeah um but what you learn is when your sister who grew up in the family sends you all the photos the big green suitcase with the photos in it <laughs> because she wants you to feel part of it and you open it up and she's like who the hell is this 
Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. okay, you can appreciate them for being part of a bloodline. You yeah. share a bloodline. So mm -hmm. there's something there. Yeah. However, the recognition and relationship wasn't built. So you then realize that, okay, there's, a, there's something there that's important, but there's a key here in the milk line. So it, it, that's just a comment I was going to make. But okay, so Heartline, I think that speaks to what you were talking about a little bit before when you said that you felt that there are people who are very close to you, mm -hmm. who are our ancestors of the heart. Mm -hmm. In some way, you recognize them mm -hmm. as being very close. I mean, my, I mean, there are people you, you call sister or brother mm -hmm. or, yeah. oh gosh, you're my uncle. You know, these are the people with whom you have great rapport. And they too, when you think about relationships with them, how close you can become, mm -hmm. it may be absolutely appropriate, given their permission and their disclosures, mm -hmm. to invoke or evoke a connection with their ancestry. Because mm -hmm. there's something about that, that line, that wisdom, those life experiences that can be helpful to you. That's another resource. That could be another pool. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, I think what happens with a, a heart connection, you find that with um, very strongly, perhaps with a teacher, someone who is the head, even perhaps of something we would call a lineage. Mm -hmm. For example, your Reiki teacher, yeah. you have a very deep heart connection with that person. And so mm -hmm. In that case, you might actually have two connections. That would be a tradition connection mm -hmm. because you're connecting through the line of Reiki, mm -hmm. who developed it. You go all the way to the origins and uh, pull that down from, from hand to hand to hand to yeah. hand, attunement yeah. to attunement to attunement. Mm -hmm. And some yeah. people can go way back and they're like, um, you know, it, it many traditions, particularly in the martial arts. And yeah. I think we see it more often in Eastern traditions. You mm -hmm. have this long lineage yeah. of people who taught people who taught people who taught mm -hmm. people who taught people. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's another whole, another whole pool. Mm -hmm. So um, if, for example, you know, I just met somebody, uh, a new member of the group or whatever, and I just in talking to them, I instinctively felt that that connection with them so now is what kind of line or lineage would that be i mean you, you know like no. you feel the connection you have so many commonalities your way of thinking of approach about something is the same um you know it just you feel like you've known this person for a very long time right and and you know that's kind of a hard question to answer mm -hmm. because you know it depends on how you view cosmology and, and the disciplines you're practicing mm -hmm. if you're going to pull that in as an ancestral thought mm -hmm. um you know okay maybe we were related through i mean if you go back far enough there are six eves in africa and oh. so these six <laughs> these six eves gave uh, birth to everybody yeah. you know so it's like okay so we're all cousins Really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, however, the other, another thought you could think about is this whole reincarnational pool. Yeah, yeah. And so perhaps you were indeed kin in a past life. Mm -hmm. And so that is reflected in a sudden recognition in this moment here presently. Uh -huh. Got it. Got so, it. I mean, that's a possibility too. Yeah, it's it's always a challenge to, uh, you know, say this is this and this is that because, you know, <laughs> you put your put a label on something and somebody's going to turn around and say, no, you're wrong. It's this. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. it, there's, a lot of it's open to debate, but there certainly are moments where the whole idea of reincarnational pool is uh, is present. I'll give a, a bit of a, <clears throat> a hint about this different cultures look at the soul in very different ways mm -hmm. so there are some um traditions in which you know here we are in the west it's like i've got one soul it goes away psh, i'm gone mm -hmm. there are other traditions uh, and i rely heavily on the mongolian buryat kind of um region of the world you mm -hmm. have three souls and each of those souls 
um, comes together to provide an incarnation in this life, mm -hmm. but each of them had a separate origin. Some of them came from an ans one of those souls came from an ancestral pool, mm -hmm. which means everybody in your ancestry came out of that same pool. So it's kind of like a recycling of soul parts. Yeah, yeah. Um, another comes from kind of like a tradition pool you know, you know, certain types of people, and then one just comes from nature. And so their, their, um, their destinations at the point of death yeah. are very different. Yeah. And they're, um, you, you, some of them reincarnate, one doesn't, the one from nature just goes back to nature. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, we're pulling together pieces, parts that, <laughs> you know, some of it's ancestral. Native yeah. Americans, we don't often think of them as having reincarnation as part of their mm -hmm. traditions. Mm -hmm. Yet, if you look, mm -hmm. there are hints of reincarnation in some of their traditions. Mm -hmm. You have um, children who are recognized for certain qualities, for certain um, affinities, and people know that this was perhaps great uncle so-and-so. And in fact, the child gets that name so wow. the child is a perpetuation of an ancestral line yeah so i mean it, it just you can kind really of lose your mind thinking about it, it is it is yeah. so this idea of who is our ancestor who are we who are we related to becomes a really really huge question yeah yeah so um I wanted to ask this, I have this <clears throat> down in our description for, for today. I know what my answer would be, but are spirits that contact you your ancestors? Some of them could be, mm -hmm. some of them could be. In fact, I like the way um, <clears throat> Orion Foxwood talks about this when he talks about the fairy seership tradition. Mm -hmm. He talks about the voices that contact us. Um, oftentimes, they're the voices in our blood. So you think about your blood having yeah. voices wow. and there's a whole tradition of redeeming your ancestors that comes from the fairy tradition. So we all come through life. And, you know, I talked about my Nana having her, her experience. Yeah. She also had what would be called in tr the tradition, her, um, I know what it is. I always mess up this word. I want to say conundrums, a paradox. Oh. That's the word I want. Paradox. Paradoxes. They have their paradoxes where there are points where they're not acting perhaps where they think they should or, you know, mm -hmm. you just screw up yeah. your yeah. paradox. <laughs> and so there's, there's a tradition of working with ancestors to heal those paradoxes. Mm -hmm. And you can do that after they're dead. And some of it may come in the form of the shamanic work that's called psychopomp. You mm -hmm. actually help escort them from place to place. Yeah. So, so you can have spirits come to you who, who are ancestral. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and just because they're an ancestor, though, doesn't always make them benevolent. Mm -hmm. Some of them come, and in fact, some of the loudest ones mm -hmm. are the ones who have problems and need the help of the human incarnated yeah. being yeah. to yeah. perhaps yeah. trans uh, get them to where they need to go yeah. to on. help reconcile something. Yeah, and so um, it can, it it can be a great honor, and if you actually take ancestor work to heart, part of your 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 work is to bring reconciliation, to bring healing and balance to whole lines of ancestry. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I just kind of want to say the phrase, it's not always about you. <laughs> you know, it's oh, like, right, right. It's, exactly. It's, you know, it's, if I can help them out there, you know, it's, mm -hmm. I know that just here on earth, if I physically can help somebody <clears throat> that makes me feel a lot better, you know, so it's kind of enriching, you know, so just can imagine if you can help lines of ancestors, you know, it's like they were troubled yeah. by a something or other that happened back in the 1600s. And, you know, you can kind of help move that along, you know, I just, um, I, you know, I always feel that whatever I do that is a benefit to anyone impacts the lineage, impacts their lines and right. packs my lines you know it's kind of like for the good of all you know that phrase when you say for the highest and best you know it's like mm -hmm. it, there's highest and best um that happens better than you can imagine really you know when you when you go and offer your physical hand to those in the other realm mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. It's ripples in the pond. Yeah. You, you have yeah. one event, but the consequences of that yeah. expand yeah. incredibly. And, you know, yeah. somebody was saying one time, um, I, I guess it was a, a conversation about some political person. Yeah. And don't you wish we could, could do something about this political person? And my comment was, well, if you go back far enough in the line and heal some ancestors, you probably have common ancestors with that person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if you heal that common ancestor, who mm -hmm. knows how that's going to trickle out yeah. and perhaps have an effect. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, so ancestor work can be pretty significant yeah. if you think about it. Yeah, yeah. Pretty significant. Yeah. Can you, um, can you, uh, <laughs> the dogs agree. I know. I forgot I have a barker with me. Um, <laughs> let me let someone in and they could come to a barking dog. There. No, not everybody. I'll be right there. <laughs> okay, everybody. Out of here. No, 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 so, oh, and who's um, that little one? Who is I, that? She's the biggest one. This is there. She's got the biggest mouth of all of them. So, um, <laughs> if you can kind of tell us about the class that you're teaching on the 16th, what exactly are you covering um, in ancestry? Uh, you know, what will we be doing? And while you're doing that, I am going to go yell at the dogs. <laughs> Give them hell, Joe. <laughs> Okay, so the class, the class will probably um, start with, I like to start with a, a call to the ancestors. And it's something we're going to be able to peel apart bit by bit to understand what each of the calls means and, and how we're, we're construing it. And then we'll go through the idea of kinship, a little bit of genealogy, again, the, the varied pools from which we can draw ancestry. I'll talk a little bit about an ancestral altar, and we may do a couple of experiential pieces to kind of warm up to this idea of ancestors and how to make a connection. So that's what I think we'll be doing in the class. And perfect timing. She's that, back. So you I missed have no it. Idea what we're doing in the class. <laughs> I just I explained. We'll talk a little bit about calling in the ancestors. Mm -hmm. If and what I recommend is that people, as you start thinking about ancestors, think about the kind of call you would make to them. Mm -hmm. And the suggestion at the end of the class is to write your own ancestral call. Mm -hmm. A call being kind of an acknowledgement, um, mm -hmm. an evocation, which is more of a summoning than an invocation, which is an embodiment. You're just evoking them. You're bringing them forth to share their information. And so, so by doing that, then um, we will have a little bit better understanding of our ancestral connection, correct? I think you'll be acknowledging it. I think one of the ways I think about this is um, I had a teacher recently tell me, we have multidimensional selves, right? Mm -hmm. And if you simply say hello to your multidimensional self, you'd be surprised at the kind of information you might be come through just because you've acknowledged that and opened up to receiving information. Mm -hmm. It's the same way with ancestors. If we call, if we acknowledge, we've suddenly opened up to receive information, it's subtle. I mean, sometimes it may hit you on the head. You, you go to your jewelry box and your mother's ring falls out. Okay, mom wants to t tell me something. Okay, I'm gonna wear the ring today and see what happens. You know, it can be, you know, pretty blatant or it can be very subtle. Oh, I think I smell my dad's pipe. Any of these things, just very messages. And I think it's a recognition too that when we call to the ancestors, we're telling ourselves that the veil is thin. That it, it just because they're not present physically, that doesn't mean they aren't still interacting with us in some ways. And so it's, it just reinforces some of the things we, we think about, but aren't always top of mind. 
Yeah, I know that um, when, um, and, and please, if anybody has any questions that you would like us to address in the recording, please feel free to go ahead and type them in the chat window. If not, we're going to sign off pretty soon and then we can go live and we can just, you know, talk with Shana briefly. Um, but I know that um, because I am intuitive and I can tap into those in, in the other world. And I know sometimes it could be a simple a simple comment like, oh, it's, you know, I see a, a gold ring with a red stone that's in a little box in the drawer by your night table. And then they look at that and they see an engraving of the jeweler, you know, and then you could look up the jeweler and then, you know, the, it's like your investigation begins. But I've also found that, you know, by the more energy that you put into it, you know, things will start to unravel and unfold before you. Absolutely. The attention we give to something is returned in kind. So you ignore your ancestors. They're probably going to ignore you. But one and I think there, there have been admonitions that once you undertake this, this, this pathway of recognizing your ancestors, it's not something to be done lightly. Um, there's a lot of healing work that can be done, a lot of balancing, a lot of um, reconciliation, uh, healing those those paradoxes. So it's not something you just kind of say, well, okay, it's a hobby. I'll do it this weekend and next weekend we're on to the next thing. You know, there, there's some sincerity that that attaches to this. It's like having a new friend, you know, you, you, you just don't like use your new friend because they happen to own the candy store and you're going to get the free candy. Okay, we're done with you. I don't need the candy anymore. No, you know, there's sincerity. You're building a relationship as with any ally, yeah. especially at my context it, uh, in framework is the shamanic. Yeah. You have to pay attention to your allies. Mm -hmm. You know, these are friends, text them, write them, talk to them. It's a you relationship. Know. That you it's have a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's a very special relationship because it's not only something that was present in some way physically. And I mean, it still is physical if you're talking about your blood mm -hmm. and, you know, even your milk line, because you have been impressed mm -hmm. significantly by both. Mm -hmm. But now it's at the spirit level. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Fascinating topic. Um, I, I want to go ahead and close this as far as the recording is concerned. And I please invite everybody that is on this call to um, to stay on and hang on for a few more minutes. And if you have any questions uh, about the class on the 16th or about what we discussed today, uh, feel free to do so. So for everybody else, thank you very much for joining Shana and I and everybody yeah, thank you. else. We'll see you soon.